gonna take my time I have all the time in the world to make you mine It is written in the stars above Open up your eyes my eyes I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth and that maybe it'll fade too with time but I, I don't think so that haunts me the most out there without me cause I know you can't be cause it's no good If you'd like to follow me on social media, you can do so on Twitter at Peaked Interest, where the interest is spelt with a one, or on Patreon, on patreon.com forward slash that movie show. If you could also leave a like and subscribe and share the video, that would be super helpful. Thanks, guys. The car pulls up at Mackenzie Williamette Hospital in Springfield. Stepping out of the car, a panicked and injured Diane Downs shouts for help. Inside the car are three children. Seven-year-old Cheryl Downs, three-year-old Danny Downs, and eight-year-old Christy Downs. Cheryl is dead on arrival. Danny and Christy had both been shot and seriously injured. Sitting in the driver's seat was their mother, Diane Downs who had also been shot. The car was drenched in blood. Diane was born in Phoenix, 1955. She didn't have a happy childhood according to her and claimed that her father sexually abused her from the age of 12. She graduated high school and then enrolled at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College in California. But she was expelled after just one year due to promiscuous behaviour and she went to live back with her parents in Arizona. A few years later, in 1973, Diane married her high school boyfriend Steve and ran away from home. Diane later stated that marrying Steve was not something she did for love, but to simply escape from her family. A year later, she had her first child, a girl called Christy. Another girl, Cheryl, followed in 1976 and finally Danny in 79. One year after Danny's birth, the couple then divorced as Stephen thought that Diane had been having an affair and that young Daniel was the product of that affair. She decided to act as a surrogate for a couple who couldn't conceive in 1982 saying, people have wondered why I won't regret this, giving up this baby, and that's very easy to answer. When you kill a child, when you have an You've terminated something. You've murdered somebody. It's cruel. It's terrible. But when you do something out of love, when you carry a child for somebody else and turn that life over to them, you haven't done anything bad. And it's nothing you look back on and regret. After contacting the medical staff for help, Diane told staff that they had been shot during an attempted carjacking. Cheryl had died before arrival at the hospital while Danny had been paralyzed from the waist down after being shot in the back. And Christy was shot twice in the chest, which had caused her to have a stroke and it had left her disabled. Diane herself had been shot in the left arm. Diane told the story of driving on a country road when a stranger flagged down her car. She stopped to see what the man wanted, only for him to demand she leave the car so that he could take it. Not wanting to leave herself and kids there stranded in the rural countryside, she refused. The stranger then pulled a gun and started shooting. 
hitting Cheryl twice in the heart and lung, killing her almost immediately. Two shots hit Christy, and three-year-old Danny was shot once in the back, paralyzing him. The attacker then shot Diane in the arm, and she pushed him down and drove off in the car to the hospital at high speed, worried for her kids. Medical staff at the hospital were a little confused by Diane's behavior, as she seemed calm and controlled as her children bled out in the emergency room. Dr. Mackey, who was the attending in charge that night, stated that he saw a woman who was very calm, very self-assured, not tearful, not angry, occasionally smiling, occasionally chuckling. When I was finished taking care of Christy, then I sought out her mother, and to my complete surprise, Diane was non-emotional, not a tear in her eye. And then she says, I really ruined my new car. I got blood all over the back of it. This was later described by Diane as being in shock, while her mother stated that Diane had been hysterical on the night. At the hospital, Diane made one telephone call after being treated by doctors. She called a man named Robert Knickerbocker, a former co-worker in Arizona. Down says after she got out of the vehicle, the man opened fire on the children, killing one and injuring the other two. Downs herself suffered a gunshot wound to the left arm. Like all murders, many questions have been raised in this case. Police are pursuing all leads and would not directly answer questions about the validity of Mrs. Downs' story. Police conducted interviews with Diane and created a sketch of the attacker based on her description. A late 20s white male with shoulder length straight hair and a fringe. Medium tone of voice with no accent. Wearing a blue Levi jacket, blue jeans and a light off coloured t-shirt. She went on to tell how she was sightseeing in the rural countryside at night with her kids. When this stranger flagged down a car so she stopped and exited the vehicle to talk to him. He demanded she give up her car. She said no and he opened fire. She then pretended to throw her keys to distract him and pushed him down, jumped in the car and drove off. In the following days, police conducted searches for the stranger and the murder weapon. They didn't find either. They never found either. The police then began interviewing members of the public to gather more information. Doctors at the hospital reported to police when interviewed that they felt Diane's response to what had happened didn't match a typical emotional response for someone who had been attacked and her children murdered. When police interviewed Diane's father, he immediately relayed his skepticism about her account of the incident. I made the comment to the police department there that night. Uh, it looks to me like Diane did it because the children have been shot in the chest and Diane has only been shot in the arm. And I, I says, it really looks like she did it. Uh, that's, uh, that really is the thing that spurred them to go and check, uh, to do the Q-tips, run the Q-tips around her finger to check for the powder residue and to also spray her hands to see if she held a gun. This led to police then conducting forensic tests on the car and Diane herself. They did spatter analysis on the car to determine entry wounds and also the angle of the gunshots. They also did some swab tests on Diane's fingernails looking for gunpowder residue. Powder tests would later come back negative, as would metallic residue tests to see if she had held a gun recently. However, medical staff commented and testified that Diane had washed her hands on the night of the incident, which may have affected the tests. Blood spatter analysis also contradicted what Diane claimed, as blood traces were found on the outside of the car. Looking at it from the passenger side, I saw a blood stain uh, on the lower door frame. Diane Downs had said that the shooter leaned into the car and fired at her, at her children. And if that was the case, how did this, this blood spatter get on the outside of the car? Over the next few weeks, Diane would make repeated appearances on TV, telling her story and appealing for help locating the man who attacked her. During an interview with Ann Jager, Downs would ramble on for long periods of time and Jager would allow it to continue uninterrupted. It quickly, became clear that she was not displaying the emotions that she said she felt, and instead, it seemed the opposite. Where she should be a tearful and distraught mother, she seemed to be enjoying it. During one particular ramble, Diane would say something which would reveal how little she was thinking about her kids. Everybody says you sure were lucky. 
Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. It is very painful. It is still painful. I have a steel plate on my arm. I will for a year and a half. The, the scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. Police, wanting to get her to commit to a definite timeline of events, asked Diane to take part in a reenactment for, of the incident. She was very enthusiastic about doing so. For context, just imagine, four days ago, you and your children were brutally attacked and one of your kids was killed, and you're now being asked to reenact that for the police. It's the most traumatic event of your entire life. Think about the kind of emotions and actions that you might have when asked to reenact this event. Here is how Diane reacted. Diane was now top suspect in the investigation. But there were a few things that the police didn't yet have. The murder weapon and a motive. Rush along the country road for any clues that could lead them to the person who killed young Cheryl Lynn Downs. That includes the murder weapon, a 22 caliber automatic revolver. Divers were back in the Mohawk River near the scene of the crime, probing for anything that would help in the case. Police would be very cagey about information they released to the press, not wanting to tip off Diane that she was actually the prime suspect. During an interview with Diane, police asked for permission to look around her home for information, and Diane agreed. During the search of the home, police found stacks of private letters written by Diane to Robert Knickerbocker, the former call worker from Arizona that she'd called on the night of the incident. When police interviewed Robert, he told them that he had had a fling with Diane during a separation from his wife and stopped it when they reconciled. Diane had began stalking him and would often comment that she would kill his wife, then they could be together again. True crime author Anne Rule interviewed Robert during background for a book in which he detailed the nature of his relationship with Diane. And when I interviewed him, he said, Anne, I was just so glad when I realized she'd crossed the county line headed out of here. Uh, that I never considered following her, but she was desperate to get his attention. After leaving Arizona, she started writing letters to Robert every day to convince him to take her back. Eventually, Robert agreed to meet Diane, where he told her that he had no interest in her or her children and intended to stay with his wife and so she should move on. This didn't happen exactly this way, however as Robert admitted in court that they repeatedly broke up and got back together again even when he had reconciled with his wife. Robert did, however, make it clear that he did not want children at all. This on-off push-pull relationship led Diane to believe that the only stumbling block to her relationship was children. He would change his mind on a daily basis. I'm coming, I'm going, I'm coming, I'm going. I want a divorce, I've changed my mind, I don't want a divorce. A week and a half later he changes his mind, he doesn't want a divorce, okay? Uh, this was a real obstacle as far as Diane was concerned. Those kids were a burden. And there was no way that she could see that she was going to get this guy up to Oregon as long as she had the kids. The discovery of these letters gave police a motive, but they still lacked the murder weapon. Despite searching her home, they still did not find the gun in, used in the shooting. They did, however, find unfired casings in her home which matched the casings found in the car from the actual shooting. Evidence was mounting up, but there was still room for reasonable doubt in the story, with the shooting taking place in the middle of the rural countryside, in the middle of the night. There were no witnesses to the incident itself. Almost none. Following the shooting and repeated media interviews, tremendous pressure was placed upon the sheriff's office to make an arrest, with many suggesting that it should be Diane. The sheriff and prosecutor's office, however, didn't want to risk Diane being acquitted because due process hadn't been followed and sufficient evidence gathered. Christy Downs, Diane's daughter, had been one of two surviving children with young Danny being the other. Christy was eight years old at the time of the shooting. 
Police had intended on interviewing Christy early into the case, but unfortunately the gunshot injury had caused her to have a stroke and left her unable to speak. Christy had been on a long and gruelling battle for survival and was hospitalised for some time. During the course of her hospitalisation, a judge had placed an order against Diane visiting the trial to try and safeguard against Diane influencing potential testimony. Perhaps revealing her concerns accidentally, Diane had told police and medical staff that Christy should be allowed to die. Diane broke the judge's order by gaining permission from Christy's father Stephen to visit. During her visit, she told Christy that the police considered her a suspect in the case. While many psychologists would state that it was both inappropriate and unnecessary for her to give this information to eight-year-old Christy, some legal commentators said that it was possibly Diane trying to create doubt in court, should Christy say Diane shot her. Diane's attorney may be able to argue that the only reason Christy was saying it was because Diane had mentioned it. Diane's lawyer also repeatedly filed motions to prevent police access to Christy, stating that it would create pressure and influence for Christy to give an account favourable to prosecution. During five months of psychological counselling throughout which Diane or any member of her family were prevented from seeing Christy, she would repeatedly say that there was no stranger in the road and that the person who shot Christy and the other kids was Diane. Feeling that they now had enough evidence to convict Diane, the police arrested her. Nine months after the shooting in February 1984, Diane was arrested by the sheriff's office. News teams flocked to the jail to watch as Diane was brought in. They expected Diane to protest her innocence and to continue her unusually upbeat behaviour. But what they didn't expect was that she would be five months pregnant. How and why she became pregnant was something of a heated debate. Diane would refuse to reveal the name of the father and in an interview with Van Jager in 1983, she would say some extremely disturbing things. You can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. But children are so easy to conceive. She would also appear on Oprah in 1988 from prison and said that she had become pregnant out of loneliness. October 13th, I just went and got pregnant because I was so lonely. I love my children. I miss my children. And, and I know that sounds simplistic. It really does. And I have to admit that. And that's why I say there's so much more feeling inside than I can give in two minutes. What many speculated at the time, however, was that she had become pregnant on purpose, believing the jury would be more sympathetic towards a pregnant woman. As the trial began, the defense team carefully curated Diane's image, often having her appear in public in very reserved clothing and usually in white, to try and help her appear more innocent. She would also have a much neater and tidier hair and makeup to make her seem more calm and reasonable. The physical evidence was still circumstantial without the gun, and so the defense knew that discrediting the prosecution witnesses and evidence while simultaneously making her sympathetic in court would create enough reasonable doubt to avoid a guilty verdict. The defence team had done a good job of poking doubt into the existing evidence and testimony. All the witnesses called by prosecution had been cross-examined hard, and their stories and comments been made to seem more ambiguous than originally. The lack of gunpowder on her hands, the lack of the gun, and the ambiguous nature of blood spatter analysis had left even more room for reasonable doubt. At that point, many thought that it was almost 50-50 as to whether she would get away with it or not. The prosecution called what would be their star witness to the stand, Diane's daughter Christy. She had spent nine months in therapy for both her psychological issues and for a speech impediment as a result of the stroke she suffered. Christy had said many times that she was afraid to say who shot her because she thought that she would get in trouble. Up to this point, she had only ever written down the name of the person and placed it in a sealed envelope and then burned it as a therapy technique. But the case rested on her small shoulders. Braving the stand, Christy sat down to answer questions. Christy Downs was asked by prosecutor Fred Hugie, do you know who shot Cheryl? Christy said quietly, yes. The prosecutor struggled to keep his own composure. Who? The young girl sobbed, my mom. Hugie asked, how do you know that, Christy? She said sobbing, I watched. 
Christie then left the stand and suddenly the case seemed more secure for the prosecution than before. If jurors were not swayed by the emotional testimony of Diane's daughter, they would witness something in the closing weeks which would shock and surprise everyone, even her own attorney. The prosecution played the song Hungry Like the Wolf by Duran Duran as a reenactment was shown to the jury. The song was chosen because Christie had mentioned that Diane had played it over and over and over in the car the night of the shooting. As the song played, Diane tapped her fingers on the desk in time with the beat and lip-synced the lyrics as a shocked jury looked on. It did not look like the actions of someone who believed themselves to be innocent. It looked like someone relishing the attention. When the jury returned their verdict, it was a unanimous conviction on all counts. Two counts of attempted murder and criminal assault and one count of murder in the first degree. The judge sentenced her to life in prison plus 50 years and could not even be considered for parole before 25 years. The sentences were to be served consecutively as the judge made it clear he did not intend for Diane Downs to ever be free again.